Okay, hi everybody, and a welcome to our continuing work with uh, telepathy and the etheric vehicle video commentary. We did some work on this uh, yesterday, and uh, at the moment, uh, this is the 23rd of November, and we're working on program number 32. Um, and we're on page 83. And maybe, I wonder, do we have a little segue here? I'm not sure. <clears throat> what does it say? The responsibility of impressionability <clears throat> of telepathic registration and of invocative appeal is very great. Uh, and then he says, hence, um, <clears throat> what I have written here. Okay. Well, let's just say that uh, if we're going to impress individuals and uh, if our groups are going to impress groups, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, then we have to be very careful about the nature of the impression. We are more uh, responsible than we know. And he tells us he's uh, coming at this from a different angle. And uh, he's dealing with uh, group possibilities and with groups that can be uh, trained to record, register, and be impressed by the hierarchy. Make that even a little bigger. And um, groups of this nature can be, um, can find themselves in a position where they um, can indeed invoke the hierarchy with power uh, if it, if they so choose, or any group uh, that, that can record, register, and be impressed. And now we've been given um, scientific invocations to assist uh, in that process of invocation. All right, <clears throat> that gives a little bit of, just a little background, of course, you can always uh, pick up uh, Program 31, uh, as you wish to. Now, this, um, this particular document is a very big one, and uh, it includes all that we have spoken about in relation to this uh, book. Uh, Telepathy and the Etheric Vehicle. So, um, let's see what we can do this evening with program 32. And beginning from page 83, an entirely new section. 
really what's being given here by the Tibetan uh, is is very um, <clears throat> very exciting stuff. Um, where would we find uh, such material presented in such an organized and scientific manner? In fact, we we would not at the present time find such material. What a task he has had as um, the um, instructor of uh, Helena Blavatsky, who was in some respects uh, an amuensis for him, a person who took dictation, who took down his thought, not the same way as Alice Bailey as an amanuensis. She was, uh, well, I wonder if I can rightly say that she was <coughs> less um, independent than Blavatsky and that they worked uh, the Tibetan and Alice Bailey worked in still more tight uh, verbal um, interplay together and uh, are said to have evolved a type of English which was particularly suitable for the kind of information that the Tibetan was trying, trying to get across. And now just a few years remain until 2025. The, um, the centennial conclave of the hierarchy and a time when the Tibetan says uh, he will work again on this uh, series of bridging treatises towards the knowledge of the Aquarian age, towards the knowledge of the uh, new age. <coughs> I'll get that uh, voice cleared out pretty soon, hopefully. So let's go on a bit now. And uh, we don't know how far we will get. It's an 11-page section, so probably we don't uh, complete it. The relation, relation of the human to the hierarchical center. And DK tells us that a true telepathic rapport is part of the supreme science of contact and has peculiar and definite reference to humanity. True telepathic rapport. And uh, we're, we're interested in finding out what is this uh, supreme science of contact. <clears throat> uh, many different uh, terms might be used in an effort to convey some understanding of this subtle subjective mode of relationship. Um, so here's a little bit of an encapsulation, um, which certainly helps us as we try to uh, condense what the 
Uh, Tibetan has said. So the uh, Tibetan um, appears to be trying to uh, simplify things for us as we consider um, this uh, subtle subjective mode of relationship. That's uh, the trouble. We may become confused because there are so many terms and we want to know how they fit uh, with each other. So, some terms that have been used. Well, maybe above all, the science of contact, or as it is called, the supreme science of contact, the science of impression, the science of invocation and evocation, also a technique, as he says, the science of relationship, and that's one, uh, it's in a list in esoteric astrology, I've been looking for it uh, in vain lately, but uh, I know it's there. And uh, the science of sensitivity, the basic science of sensitivity, and uh, the supports for this supreme science of contact are the science of impression, the science of invocation and evocation, the science of sensitivity, and now he adds in general the science of relationship. If we can just keep these terms uh, straight in our minds, then we will be in a better condition than otherwise. And less confused. Um, he goes on to say, all these terms convey different aspects of the reaction of form or forms to contact, to impression, to impact, to environment, and may I add, including a very subtle environment, <clears throat> to the thought context of various minds, to ascending and descending energies, to the invocation of agents, and the evocation of their uh, response. Now, we can invoke below, but I think we're talking about invoking above, really. So, um, this is an important statement. I'm going to read it again. And let's see what we have here, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I've been using yellow and sort of the purple. It's, it's not uh, that they are always appropriate colors, but uh, they are at least useful in discriminating um, one sort of idea flow from another. 
And if we could, may I add, um, understand the different aspects conveyed, again, we would be ahead and would leave confusion behind. So, uh, when we are dealing with a science for which the wording does not yet uh, exist with uh, accuracy, It's only natural that uh, confusion will uh, be part of our attempted apprehension. So all these terms, um, and we've just gone over five of them, these sciences, the supreme science of contact, the science of impression, the science of invocation and evocation, the science of sensitivity, and to add to that now, the science uh, of relationship, all these um, convey, says the Tibetan, different aspects of the reaction of form or forms to contact, to impression, to impact with its um, implied interactivity, to environment with uh, all of its uh, hidden factors, to the thought context of various minds, as in normal telepathy, I'm interposing, you know, my own thoughts here too, to ascending and descending energies, to the invocation of agents and the evocation of their response. As I say, that can occur whether we're invoking uh, above towards a higher point of tension and expecting an evocative response, or whether we're invoking below and also expecting an evocation. The masters do invoke us and expect some type of evocative uh, response from us. And now uh, we take a very big picture. As the Tibetan says, the whole planetary system, uh, he's right now confining himself to the uh, planet, but uh, there are other larger contextual systems that could also be referenced in relation to what he's saying now. <clears throat> the whole planetary system is in reality a vast interlocking, interdependent, and interrelated complexity of vehicles, um, I suppose emanating from the planetary logos, really, uh, interrelated complexity of vehicles communicating or responsive to communication. So here are uh, 
sent forth, I would estimate, from the planetary logos. Um, a vast, interlocking, interdependent, and interrelated complexity of, and may I add, emanated vehicles communicating or responsive to communication. So, you know, if we're going to pause there and just try to <clears throat> try to visualize what that could mean. What could that mean? In a sense, uh, I could interpolate that we are potentially in touch with every one of these uh, emanated vehicles. Sometimes you see these Tibetan tankas and they really sh uh, show how important the whole um, conception of emanation was to Buddhist uh, thinkers. Now, potentially these emanations are in touch with uh, each other, whether on the same level or between lower um, emanations and those who are still holding a higher point of tension or between uh, emanations which stand above lesser emanations and are interacting with those lesser emanations. Everything in touch with everything else. You even think about that second sense and all of its higher octaves, the sense of touch. Now, some of these interactions are of greater importance than others. No question about that. But basically, um, everything is communicating. And this is all a uh, part of that um, supreme science of contact. Okay. Well, you know, um, I could interpolate that uh, so many people find uh, such a communication as this between a master and his students to be far-fetched and unprovable and overall probably fanciful 
and false. But the further you read and think about it, the more uh, the viability of this communication, i.e. the, the book, uh, becomes very reasonable to us and represents a kind of um, experience or thought form um, which is not yet shared by the many. So simply because it's a bit unusual and seems to speak so scientifically of things that many have never heard about or thought about does not mean that it is not valid. Okay. The moment that this interrelated and communicating system is studied from the angle of relationships, remember here the um, science of relationships listed as one of the five above, then the processes of evolution and the goal of the spirit of man, which is in reality the spirit of the planetary logos, becomes of vital and supreme importance, but at the same time most difficult to comprehend. Well, DK is giving us some assurance that our difficulty in comprehending all this is uh, a very natural thing. Um, so this interrelated and communicating system is studied from the point of view of the science of relationships. And then um, the goal of the spirit of man, and this is an important statement, the spirit of man, which is in reality the spirit of the planetary logos. Okay, the spirit of man, the spirit of the planetary logos, they are the same. And this is uh, a bit like saying that, well, yes, there is a universal Logos. And uh, really, finally, and ultimately, there is no difference between what we um, spiritually are, um, essentially are, and that planetary Logos. So this little statement is powerful. So it's the processes um, of evolution and the goal of the spirit of man, which is in reality Think of it, the spirit of the planetary Logos, his essence, its essence, is our essence. And then all that becomes of vital and supreme importance. 
but um, are at the same time most difficult to comprehend. So, one is the processes of evolution, and the other is the goal of the spirit of man. These two factors are here being discussed, and thus the use of the word are rather than is. This we could really dwell upon. That the spirit of man is, in reality, the spirit of the planetary logos. Ultimately, um, there's only there's only one spirit really throughout the entire universe, any particular universe. And if we go farther than that, depending on how we want to define the word spirit, we find ourselves encountering the one without a any secondary factor. And that would be the absoluteness we find ourselves encountering that it turns out really that every one of us is the most essential factor in all of cosmos and more still we find out that what we thought was ourselves uh, really are the absoluteness or maybe I should say word is <laughs> here that which we thought we were is really and essentially and forever without beginning and end the absoluteness okay so hold that in mind that strong statement that the spirit of man is in reality the spirit of the planetary logos it gives a um, a new dignity to every apparently uh, isolated emanated human being of course it also applies to every kingdom in nature if you strip away everything but what is here referred to as the spirit it will be if it's on this planet it will um, for the most part be found to be the spirit of the planetary logos and notice the difference in spelling the spirit of man lowercase s and spirit of the planetary logos the higher case s Well, I, I just would have to say 
that as we progress in our understanding, so much that seemed to be out there, so to speak, um, is determined to be uh, in here. Now, you know, that word is interesting. If you say in here, then we have also the suggestion of the word inherent, putting the two together. Well, then the Tibetan says something that uh, may come as a relief to us or may simply indicate the scope of what it looked like we were trying to do. So immense is the theme that it is profitless for us to do more than deal with two factors. So immense. And it is the Tibetans' um, grasp of amplitude, of scope, of immensity, which uh, is so different from our own very confined um, grasp. Well, you could say, well, we're sending space probes out there and we've gone beyond Pluto and uh, I don't know where some of these uh, possible cameras are headed. But still, that is a relatively superficial exploration. The inner worlds are left out of it entirely. The inner worlds are not a part of what is being explored. And once they are part of what's being explored, then a little something of the immensity of the theme uh, begins to appear. Okay, so the Tibetan is interested that from what he says, we shall gain um, spiritual, uh, intellectual, uh, intuitive uh, profit. And so he tries to be, I think, very f practical about it. Um, and just say, there's only two factors we can really deal with. Uh, to um, accrue to ourselves profits. I mean, you wouldn't want to be reading a book and uh, learn all about things that in the last analysis proved to be profitless to the manner in which you lived your incarnation successfully. So the first is the science of impression in relation to mankind. 
And the second is the impressing centers as they affect the understanding of relationship. Because after all, um, when we are impressed, uh, that impression is coming from an emanated source. And here it seems to imply that the source is higher than the agent impressed. So these are the two These are the two. The science of press impression in relation to mankind and the uh, points of tension, we might call them, uh, which are impressing centers and how the impression coming from these generally higher points of tension affect the understanding of uh, relationship. The, we, we have determined before that impact um, produces interactivity. So I think I'll just put that in bold because it's all important. Now, right now we know or have a very strong faith and maybe the experience to confirm that one of the most important for us impressing centers is the Tibetan himself. There are other important impressing centers but as we are students of the Tibetan, he plays a major role in bringing the impression to us, producing impact, which itself in response uh, produces interactivity. So these are the two. two factors. Now, after mentioning so many factors, let's see how he um, places his emphasis. The, um, he goes on to say, the many modes of contact between the many subhuman and superhuman forms uh, groupings and kingdoms are too intricate in their nature to be grasped at this time, maybe later, by students and, which is more important, he goes on to say, the information would be of 
small use to them. So we can imagine the kind of um, complexity of the interactivity which would appear um, through the uh, many modes of contact um, I guess there's no sense ex expending time on matters of great intricacy and complexity if they are not really uh, maximally helpful to the human being um, spending such time in grasping the interactivity. Uh, probably the Tibetan knows quite a bit about that um, and makes his judgment on the basis of his um, his knowledge. Okay. So he seems to be whittling down the areas upon which he will concentrate, having mentioned uh, a number of other areas which will not sustain uh, the same concentration at this time or at that time. So he says, we will therefore confine ourselves to the science of impression and the science of invocation and evocation only insofar as they affect humanity. These from the human angle cover reception of impression and of ideas and expressions of the consequences of sensitivity at this time in this particular cycle. I guess we must say that uh, sensitivity will be greater in cycles to come. So let's um, let's sort of highlight um, what he will like to find my cursor. Yeah. He will at least deal with these factors. Oh. So only so far as these sciences, now these two, by the way, are in that list of five immediately above 
only so far as the sciences mentioned really affect humanity. And um, as the human being uh, sees these sciences, they cover, says the Tibetan, reception of impression and ideas of ideas and expressions of the consequences of sensitivity at this time. And in this particular cycle. So that's one thing they cover, reception uh, of impression and of ideas. And maybe this is a little harder to understand, expressions of the consequences of sensitivity at this time and in this particular cycle. It sounds like a, a consider considerable generalization. So DK has, in a way, narrowed the field. Let's see if he sticks to that narrowing because his mind is so expansive and so organized that he seems to bring in other factors just as a matter of course. And, uh, you know, obviously, friends, well, we're working together on this, but it's a book that has to be read more than once. Or, or maybe the video commentaries that basically offer every word the Tibetan has spoken in this regard has to be listened to more than once. Probably we have to make decisions about the areas upon which we will concentrate. As he spoke to someone who had a powerful third ray, I think, and an overstimulated mind, he said, you cannot range over the entire planet and somehow expect to grasp the entire process. Those are my words, but that, that was the idea. The idea is you cannot really extend your uh, apprehension of knowledge across the entire planet. So we willingly have to undertake some kind of limitation so that at least the thoughts that come to us are not simply vague and unformulated. only in so far as they affect humanity. But of course, they're going to affect the subhuman kingdoms as well, because humanity is the uh, uh, macrocosm to these lower 
kingdoms. What what are the consequences of sensitivity? Can we manage them? The consequences of sensitivity. The basic science of sensitivity. Listed uh, in several places above. Uh, definitely um, our appreciation of the whole, the wholeness or lack of appreciation depends upon the degree of sensitivity we have built uh, into our um, response apparatus <clears throat> and DK certainly is telling us that uh, all of this will change because it's sensitivity now, at this time, and in this particular cycle, whatever cycle he may mean, we're certainly not yet given all the different cycles that would come along with the uh, power or city of the third subplane of the atomic plane, where, uh, whereupon we find um, all knowledge. Now, right away, you are alerted to the fact that you cannot really absorb all knowledge. It pretty well has to be confined to our planetary logos. So we have to look out for words uh, wherein the qualification is implied. We won't have all knowledge of the solar system and of the subtler planes and finally even of the galaxy and beyond. No, we will not have that kind of all knowledge. Okay. So we go on a bit. with the Tibetan who says, we are to consider therefore the relation of the human center, usually considered to be the throat center of uh, Sanat Kumara with the uh, new group of world servers consisting of the higher types of human beings being the uh, Ajna center. We are to consider, says the Tibetan, therefore, the relation of the human center to the hierarchical center and the growing responsiveness of humanity to the center where the will of God is known. I mean, what would be, may I interpolate, what would be the use of the shambolic uh, impacts if we could not begin to respond as the Christ responded to the uh, to Shambhala, to the center where the will 
of God is known. Okay. Oop. So it's the relationship of the human center to two centers. One being the hierarchy, which is much closer to humanity and able to successfully impress it. And the other being the center where the will of God is known, which for most human beings is uh, very remote. So um, let's see if I can... just bold this up a little bit. So, relation between the human and the hierarchical center that's number one, and I think we can begin to fathom that. And maybe not so much a relation, but a kind of responsiveness of humanity to the um, Shambhala Center. Now, I think so many of us would consider ourselves fortunate if we really were responding to the hierarchy in an uh, progressive and interactive way. As far as the center of divine purpose with, over which uh, Sanat Kumara is the king, well, that kind of responsiveness still seems uh, rather distant. Okay. Now, Let's see what else he has to say. Yeah, I can pretty well tell you that there's no way that I'm going to be doing um, 11 pages here. That's more like the uh, three programs. And this is program 32. So, as I have said before, and we have to uh, interpolate, we have to note when there is a master teacher, the factor of uh, um, repetition for assimilation becomes very important. We just don't get it the first time, at least not usually. As I said before, it is not my intention to give here the rules governing telepathic intercourse. Okay. And I guess there are 
rules. such intercourse, um, telepathic intercourse, is found between, I mean, quite naturally I would say, is found between man and man and groups and groups. And the relationship is slowly and normally developing and requires uh, no hastening. Uh, it is developing as the other senses of man and his apparatus of perception have developed. Okay. So he doesn't want to get into too much detail. And I'll simply make this, this is an important statement, after all, not everything is in a rush. And, uh, this needs no hastening. In the rules of the road, a master DK says, there is no rush, no hurry, and yet there is no time to lose. And then more, those rules of the road are, again, absolutely foundational. And the road uh, represents a type of progress uh, along an elevatory ladder from point of tension to higher point of tension to higher point of tension. So I know we human beings are in a hurry to achieve, but no uh, hastening at this time anyway is required. And telepathic sensitivity is undergoing a natural type of development. The Tibetan says it is developing as the other senses of man and his apparatus of perception have developed. So the <clears throat> and in that, I think uh, we can have some confidence. The whole process uh, is one of um, one requiring patience, no question about that. But here is the caveat. Humanity is, however, outstripping telepathic development in the rapid 
responsiveness of entire groups and of human beings en masse to group impression and to group impartation of ideas. The sudden response of groups and nations to mass ideologies has been both unexpected and difficult to handle wisely and constructively. It was not anticipated. Imagine that. <laughs> it was not anticipated by either Shambhala or the hierarchy that mass impression would develop more quickly than that of individual sensitivity, but it has happened that way. Um, the individual within a group and working within a group is far uh, more correctly sensitive than is the man struggling alone to render himself sensitive to impression. Now that is, I would say, a very um, unexpected. Imagine if hierarchy and even Shambhala do not anticipate such developments. And here it is. It was not anticipated by either Shambhala or hierarchy that mass impression would develop more quickly than individual sensitivity, but that's the way it happened. So the group is turning out to be an accelerant, accelerant for the individual. And um, And there's such a contrast between uh, ideologies to which the different groups add here. They are an example of telepathic uh, development on a group sense, in a group sense. Sometimes you look, or I do anyway, being uh, American, looking at how the two different factions in that dualistic country, the United States, uh, operate with respect to each other. They are certainly swept by different rays. And uh, they um, hold tightly to their particular uh, persuasion. So this is what had not been expected. And that tells us, doesn't it, something about exaggerating the potency of, of hierarchy. Um, as if they are infallible. Well, 
we don't know who came up with the idea, or at least I don't, of the infallibility of the Pope. And any Pope would, well, in his reasonable mind, would know that he's not infallible by any means. However, we have something still higher here. We have hierarchy. We have Shambhala. And they, too, appear to be, uh, in this respect, fallible. They just didn't see it coming. So I guess this also tells us something about group progress in the new or Aquarian age. Now, the true law of group progress comes in under Capricorn and is a law of the soul called the law of elevation. But there's no question that Aquarius will contribute much to the sense of group progress during that age uh, named after it. So this gives us a little sense of proportion and um, disinclines us to exaggerate the potency of hierarchy and even the potency of Shambhala. There is some kind of uh, worshipful orientation in humanity so that when uh, some entity or group of entities is respected or uh, deemed to be of high value, uh, it's not long before it's deemed, they are deemed to be perfect. And that just isn't so. so Master DK has uh, spoken about how the masters know more or less where they stand and are often amused by the additional powers which the devoted um, adherent um, confer upon them. It's a bit like saying, okay, and in a very literal sense, um, there is God the Father, but Jesus actually is God. Now, unless we know something about identification, um, we are speaking incorrectly. The emanation, Jesus, is not God unless you look for the essence of that emanation. Okay. Uh, occasionally, um, we find DK uh, offering us cautionary tales of things that might have gone We all know 
that as an emanation, uh, Jesus is not Sanat Kumara or is not the planetary logos. Now, in essence, that assessment might be actually different. And in essence, they are the same. But there's a tendency in humanity to conflate the good with the perfect. Now, let's think about that. The tendency to conflate the good, however good it may be, with the perfect. And that um, we, having a greater sense of proportion, that we cannot really abide. Okay. Looks like I <laughs> jumped quite a bit there. Well, I'll tell you what. This is not as long a program as I might have anticipated. And maybe I'll have a chance to do a little more a little later this evening. We have gone as far as page 85. And I think we began on page 83, which is the maybe the length of the usual type of program, which is a bit more than an hour. But in the interest of contributing my little bit to clarity, I think we can um, stop at this point and we'll see whether more may be possible. So I will, um, we would be talking about the obstructions to telepathic development when next we resume. And this will, let's see. So this was program 32, and it did go from 83 to 85. Now, um, it would be nice to get rid of this. Yeah. Okay. So here, I will insert this where we stopped. We're working on number 12. It's a lengthy section and uh, seems to go for 11 pages or so and it's just more than I think it would be wise to try to handle right now. So the end is 32 and our date 
here's the 23rd. And we went from uh, 83 to 85. And the next time when we resume, difficult to tell when, obviously I'd like to continue, but there are other things that have to be done. It will be program 33 and uh, probably will indeed be November. So, um, what I'll do is, uh, uh -huh. I'll kind of look at this and uh, place this here. Maybe I should do this without you having to bother watch me do it. Okay, friends, so that will be it for tonight, and uh, unless later on is possible, uh, we're going on with program 33 the next time, and uh, it just depends on how late I can stay up here, so uh, Tui and I and all the uh, communications team wish you uh, the very best assimilation of this uh, really difficult material. I mean, the fact that it is difficult, however, should not dissuade us from at least making the attempt. We'll be taking up um, some of the factors militating against personal uh, telepathic development. And um, we have learned that group telepathic development has proceeded unexpectedly rapidly, uh, faster than uh, personal telepathic uh, development. So uh, I'll be signing off now, and uh, this will go to uh, Michael, uh, Mikhail, and uh, it will also go to um, uh, BL and Joe and Harold and uh, several others so that you can uh, have the version that BL sends out to everybody and the more limited uh, special sendings version that uh, Michael Mikhail uh, sends out to the people who are interested in being on that uh, particular list. Okay, so we'll say goodbye to you right now and uh, hopefully uh, we will make progress uh, together. Okay, bye for now.